Hello, and welcome to week one of our webinar series, Introduction to Remote Sensing of Harmful Algal Blooms. My name is Sherry Palacios, and my co-trainer is Amita Mehta, and we will be your instructors for this webinar series. For this course, we will have a new webinar each week. The meeting days are Tuesdays, and the times will be at from 11 to 12 Eastern, and then repeat it again from 21 to 22 Eastern. The presentations for the week are as follows. We have an overview of harmful algal blooms. We have platforms and sensors, data access, and data processing. The third week will be understanding HABs in the coastal environment. And then the fourth week will be large-scale monitoring and citizen science. You'll have two homework exercises for this series, and they'll be made available after weeks two and four. And then after each session, um, there will be a period of time for question and answer. So make sure to be available and ready to put your questions into the chat. If you need to and you think of a question afterwards, you can always email us. And my email address will be made available in the chat. You'll have two homework assignments after weeks two and four. And they will be submitted through Google Forms. The homework link will be made available to you. To receive credit for homework, you must submit all answers via Google Forms by the deadline. And the deadlines are October 1st and October 15th. To receive the certificate of completion, you must attend all four live webinars and complete both homework assignments by their due date. Because it takes some time for our certificates to be made available, please be patient because it takes about two months from the end of the course to be available. There is one prerequisite for this course. It is the Fundamentals of Aquatic Remote Sensing, Session 2C. You can watch this one hour recorded webinar on your own time. And if you've not already watched it, we recommend you take the time to watch it before, session two, before week two of this session. You can access all of the course materials on the RSET website. Each week, you will be able to find PDF of the PowerPoint presentation in English and Spanish version will be available at a later date, a link to view the recording of each week's webinar, and the PDF of each homework assignment and the link to the Google form. Please note that in order to view the webinar recordings, you must register. This helps us keep track of who's viewing them and it keeps us so that we can keep track of our metrics. Once you register, you will automatically be taken to view the recording. So why take this course? There are three objectives of this course. The first is to identify NASA's Earth Science Remote Sensing Data Products for the identification and monitoring of harmful algal blooms, or HADS. To describe how coupled remote sensing and modeling approaches are used in decision support tools. And to use some NASA Earth Science data tools to monitor for HADS. Here you have the course outline. This week, I'm giving an overview of harmful algal blooms. Next week, in week two, Dr. Mehta will cover satellite platforms and sensors commonly used for ocean observations, data access tools, and an example of data processing software produced and distributed by NASA. The primary focus of this week, that week's webinar, will be on NASA Earth observing sensors. In week three, we will learn about HABs in the coastal environment. That week, we will have our guest speaker, Dr. Clarissa Anderson, talk about the tool she and her team are developing as a warning system for HABs in coastal California. In the fourth week, I will give an overview of cyanobacterial HABs or cyanohabs and provide case studies of remote sensing based tools used to monitor and predict those events. That week, we will have a guest speaker, Wilson Sauls, talk about the Cyan project of which he is a team member. This week's objective to provide an overview of marine and freshwater HABs, how they can affect ecosystem and human health, in situ monitoring methods, and how remote sensing is used for HAB detection and forecasting. This is an introductory course. Our participants come from a wide range of professional backgrounds. For our water quality professionals, this week's session may be a review of HABs. For our remote sensing professionals, this week's material may be new, but next week's sensors and data session may be a review. For all of you, we hope this series brings you more awareness 
about how remote sensing data and tools can be used for the detection and forecasting of HADs. Also, to start you thinking about how you may apply your knowledge for your own systems. Some of you are first-time participants in NASA RSET, so we thought we'd give you a brief overview. NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, or RSET, is a capacity building program whose aim is to empower the global community through remote sensing training. Its goals are to increase the use of Earth system science, and specifically NASA's Earth observations, in decision-making through training for policymakers, environmental managers, and other professionals in the public and private sector. Trainings offered fo offer focus on applications in disasters, land, health and air quality, and water resources. The Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, or RSED, is part of NASA's Applied Sciences Program. Our goal is to increase the utility of NASA Earth Science data for applied resource management professionals, policymakers, and regulatory agencies. We conduct online and in-person trainings in a variety of application areas. Our webinars consist of multi-week sessions about a specific topic and can be a combination of lectures, live demos of tools, and tutorials. All materials, including recordings of the webinars, are freely available on the RSET website. RSET operates with a gradual learn approach, where we often conduct basic introductory webinars, followed by more in-depth advanced webinars or in-person trainings. Our in-person trainings are generally more in-depth with a fewer number of participants. They also usually include case studies and participant projects that are relevant to the focused audience. These trainings require collaboration with another organization that can provide the meeting and lab space. We are also working to increase our train-the-trainer activities where we train specific targeted individuals conduct, to conduct their own remote sensing trainings. Each webinar covers the remote sensing platform, sensor, data products, and tools to access and or analyze the appropriate remote sensing data for that application. They are intended for those new to remote sensing and may have a learning prerequisite such as the Fundamentals of Remote Sensing webinar. RSET offers both online and on-site level one training. RSET follows this gradual learning approach that I mentioned before and provides basic trainings including webinars and workshops. These assume no prior remote sensing knowledge. An example of a basic training is this webinar, this HAB webinar. While we strongly suggest taking the first session of the Fundamentals of Remote Sensing, it is not required. RSET also offers more advanced trainings, including webinars and in-person trainings focused on specific application problems and data. Custom trainings can be arranged through RSET, so if you are interested in this, contact us through the RSET website. If you are interested in obtaining more information on upcoming courses and program updates, please sign up for the listserv by following the link on this page. And now to get started. Algae are simple plants that can range from microscopic single-celled organisms called phytoplankton to large macroscopic organisms often referred to as seaweeds. Their growth is primarily driven by light, nutrients, and temperature. Sometimes algae experience a proliferation of growth and that causes an algae bloom that can persist for some period of time, but then dissipate. Algae blooms are typically not harmful and are an important part of ecosystem cycles. Sometimes though, algae blooms can be harmful. What is a harmful algal bloom? Harmful algal blooms, or HABs, occur when colonies of algae, simple plants that live in the sea and fresh water, grow out of control and produce toxic or harmful effects on people, fish, shellfish, marine mammals, and birds. The human illnesses caused by HABs, though rare, can be debilitating or even fatal. Because of these human health consequences, HABs can have deleterious impacts to commercial operations. For example, an approximate approximately 10 million loss in oyster landings in Texas due to a red tide in 2011. This webinar series primarily will focus on HADs caused by phytoplankton. How can HADs be harmful? 
There are a number of ways harmful algal blooms can be harmful. These include when they produce toxins, cause economic losses, contaminate drinking water, smother benthic organisms, deplete oxygen causing hypoxic zones, impede visual predators, and attenuate light or cause a loss of light to the benthos or the bottom dwelling submerged aquatic vegetation or corals. While all of these are ways that HABs can be harmful, it is the toxin production by HABs that causes a more urgent response by natural resource managers. Toxins produced by HABs cause a number of poisonings and syndromes. U.S. coastal waters experience most of the known toxin poisonings and syndromes, and these include paralytic shellfish poisoning, amnesic shellfish poisoning, neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, ciguatara fish poisoning, the brown tide, cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms or cyanohabs, and diuretic shellfish poisoning. Some of these toxins are vectored food, through food webs and inflict harm through ingestion of contaminated food by humans or animals. And some of these toxins are present in drinking water systems. A main goal of HAB monitoring using remote sensing observations is to use remote sensing imagery as a tool to aid in the monitoring and forecasting of HAB events to understand impacts to the ecosystem or human health. The worldwide distribution of HAB toxins is wide ranging and has increased over time. In recent times, in 2016, as in this slide here, nearly all coastal regions have been afflicted with toxic HABs, often by more than one toxin or species and over large geographic ranges. These maps of HAB toxin incidents are from 2016 and demonstrate this wide geographic range and presence of multiple toxins in some locations. What is the reason for this increased incidence of HAB events? It might be due to natural phenomena such as changes in species dispersal, or due to human-caused phenomena such as increases in inputs of nutrients into waters, introduction of invasive species in ships' ballast waters, increased warming due to climate change, and even the increase in human observations as monitoring programs have become more sophisticated over time. Whatever the cause, it is clear from maps like this one and on the slide before that HAB toxins are widespread. As mentioned earlier, phytoplankton growth is often driven by light, nutrients, and temperature. Perturbations in these abiotic factors, as well as in other factors, can lead to harmful algal blooms. Some of these include nutrient loading or eutrophication, pollution, warm water, food web changes such as a loss of a key grazer in a system, introduced species, changes in water flow from events like hurricane, droughts, or floods, and also some things that we just aren't aware of yet, other unknown factors. <clears throat> so what are some of the ways HABs affect ecosystems and human health? In the next few slides, I will review some of these ways. Under the right conditions, algae can proliferate to a high density so that the oxygen evolved from photosynthesis does not offset the biological demand for oxygen. What results is a decrease in oxygen in the system to hypoxic conditions, which is unfavorable for animals and other life in the vicinity. These hypoxic conditions can result in die-off of organisms like fish, shellfish, corals, and its submerged aquatic vegetation that grow on the sea floor. Only, these organi only those organisms that can get away from hypoxic conditions may survive this unfortunate condition. Red tides are algal blooms that discolor the water, indicating a high level of phytoplankton biomass. They're not always harmful, but when they do proliferate to the point of causing major oxygen depletion, they become harmful. Red tides can occur naturally, and they can also be the result of eutrophication in a system. Where I live in Monterey Bay, California, 
we often have red tides in the fall. And these images on this slide are from field work I did as a graduate student. You can see me operating the CTD in Rosette with some of my taller colleagues. We use this instrument suite to collect water and measure salinity and temperature over depth. Along with this sampling system, optical oceanographers collect radiance, light absorption and backscattering measurements, and estimates of chlorophyll concentration using an instrument called a fluorometer. In this study, we wanted to understand if there were ways to optically characterize different phytoplankton groups so we could differentiate taxonomic groups in remote sensing imagery. The image in the upper left is really what the water looked like, kind of like orange soda. The species implicated in this red tide was Akashiwa sanguinea on the bottom left. Another way algal blooms can be harmful is through vectoring of toxins through the food web. If tainted food is consumed, it can cause a number of poisonings and syndromes as mentioned earlier. One of these is paralytic shellfish poisoning by the algal toxin saxitoxin. If a person eats food containing this toxin, symptoms appear within 24 hours and include tingling, numbness, burning in the abdomen. This is a potent toxin that can cause death. And so as a result, the presence of potentially toxic cells and the toxins themselves are widely monitored in US waters. If it is detected, fisheries are closed to harvest to protect the integrity of the fishery and more importantly, the movement of the toxins through the food web to humans. Another example of food web vectoring is amnesic shellfish poisoning. This example will be one from domoic acid poisoning. Amnesic shellfish poisoning can be caused by the ingesting food containing the toxin domoic acid, a type of amino acid. Domoic acid, or DA, is produced by some members of the genus, diatom genus, Pseudonychia, and affects the glutamate receptors of the brain. ASP can be life-threatening and can have both gastrointestinal and neurological impacts. Symptoms are varied and can include nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, as well as neurological symptoms like dizziness and notably short-term memory loss. It affects humans as well as other marine mammals such as the California sea lion pups in this image on the bottom left that were born into an unprecedented pseudonychia bloom along the California coast. And it was a, a big DA event. And these pups likely did not survive because the toxic event was so geographically widespread and persistent in time that they probably starved to death before the end of the bloom. In the US, there is large scale monitoring with rapid response and regulation of fisheries to protect human health for domoic acid bloom, or pseudonychia blooms. DA concentrations of 20 micrograms per gram of shellfish meat is the regulatory standard, but this is in the muscle tissue. Viscera, like organ meats, often have higher toxin concentrations, and they're also not included in the regulatory sampling, putting some populations of consumers at risk. For example, my father considered part of the crab digestive system called crab butter a delicacy, and he would eat it whenever given the chance. For people like him, he was at a higher risk of exposure. Some algal blooms are so dense and scatter light so effectively that they cause visual disruption to predators. For example, this recent coccolithophore bloom in the Hood Canal in Washington State, USA. Visual predators, like the harbor seal on the bottom left, can have difficulty finding prey, such as the salmon, under these conditions. Another example of how algal blooms can be harmful is with Karenia brevis which causes the Florida red tide. Corinia brevis is a type of phytoplankton known as a dinoflagellate that can grow to high densities. It produces the neurotoxin named brevitoxin. This toxin and cellular matter can be aerosolized by breaking waves into the overlying air. So the waves break and a little bit of the cell material and also the toxin gets into the air. And then that air is transported over beaches and inland areas causing respiratory distress in people who come into the contact with it. Corinia brevis has the distinction of being harmful in an impressive trio of ways. Because of the biomass that it produces, it can be an oxygen depleter. Because of the toxic vectoring through food webs, it can cause neurotoxic shellfish poisoning 
and closure of fisheries, the shellfish fishery. And because of this airborne component, it can cause negative impacts to tourism when beaches must close to protect human health. Brevitoxin has gastrointestinal and neurological effects. It is typically not life-threatening like paralytic or amnesic shellfish poisoning, though hospitalization is sometimes required. Symptoms include nausea and vomiting, as well as numbness, numbness, prickling sensations on the mouth and the lips and the tongue, dizziness, slurred speech, partial paralysis, and respiratory distress. Because of this trio, the airborne, the food vectoring, and the oxygen depletion, this organism is carefully monitored in the U.S. Gulf Coast states to protect human health and commercial interests. The last example of how HABs can affect ecosystem and human health is cyanobacterial HABs or cyanohabs. Quite a number of cyanobacterial species produce toxins that are released into the environment. Microcystis aeruginosa is a cyanohab species that produces the potent hepatotoxin microcystin. This toxin, hepato meaning liver, causes liver failure at exposure to high concentrations and liver tumors under low level chronic exposure. It cannot be neutralized by heat, evaporation, or chemical means. And when it is found in drinking water supplies, the intake of the water must be halted until the bloom has passed and toxin levels in the environment drop. In the US, the Environmental Protection Agency issues health advisories for bottle fed infants if microcystin levels exceed 0 0.3 micrograms per liter over a 10-day period, and for children and adults at 1.6 micrograms per liter over a 10-day period. In a lake nearby, or, nearby where I live, the amount is often 1,000 micrograms per liter when we have a bloom. Symptoms of microcystin poisoning include vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, liver failure, and if exposed over a long period of time, liver tumors. This pernicious toxin can kill quickly, and it can kill slowly. And some countries and jurisdictions are monitoring for its presence using in situ and remote sensing methods. Microcystis is a good candidate for remote sensing observations, as it contains gas-filled vesicles that cause the cells to rise to the surface, forming surface scums. Because these scums are emergent, they are quite visible in the red to near infrared range of the spectrum and can be detected using remote sensing imagery. In the United States, Lake Erie, one of the Great Lakes, experiences seasonal cyanobacterial blooms, which have at times caused closures of drinking water systems such as Toledo, Ohio in August 2014. That lasted for three days and affected nearly 500,000 residents. Forecasting of these cyanohabs is a high priority. Remote sensing observations, modeling, and extensive coordinated in situ sampling efforts are being used to improve forecasts of these cyanohab events to protect human health and inform research source managers on how to prevent future cyanohab events. One of the biggest takeaways we hope you gain from this webinar series is that remote sensing observations are a tool to use in monitoring and forecasting HABs. They are not a replacement for in situ monitoring. Here are some methods used for monitoring for harmful algal blooms in situ or in the water. Cell enumeration. Microscopic identification of whole water samples is the traditional method used to identify, identify harmful algae. A proficient microscopist can accurately identify algae using a light or electron microscopy. Advances in the early 2000s included automated imaging microscopy, which is still dependent on the analyst's ability to identify the species. The instrument sensitivity does not fully match the possible size range of phytoplankton, but the technology continues to advance. Work by Sosik and Olson further expanded cell enumeration capabilities with the imaging flow cytobot. So this is kind of the next generation to that automated imaging microscopy. This instrument uses both flow cytometry and imaging to observe organisms and advanced data science techniques to identify organism to taxonomic group. The instrument can be used in the laboratory or deployed as a mooring for long-term remote 
in situ monitoring. So they put it out at sea like you see in that bottom right image. Another approach to monitor for algal blooms, not specifically harmful ones, is to use fluorometry. Algae contain chlorophyll and other accessory pigments associated with the light reactions of photosynthesis. Accessory pigments can be diagnostic of particular taxonomic groups. Chlorophyll and these accessory pigments absorb light and re-emit a small proportion of it at lower energy wavelength through a process known as fluorescence. Fluorometry is used as a method to estimate chlorophyll concentration and accessory pigment concentration. Chlorophyll concentration can be used to identify the presence of algae. Chlorophyll anomalies are used to signal a sudden increase in chlorophyll or an algal bloom. And diagnostic pigments can provide information on which algal taxonomic groups are present in the water. The scattering and absorbing characteristics or inherent optical properties of the phytoplankton can also be used to shed light on which taxonomic groups are present. Toxins in the environment are measured through a number of means, including biological assays on target organisms. Analogous toxin loading analytical methods using resin beads known as solid phase adsorption toxin tracking, or SPAT. SPAT is a simple and sensitive in situ monitoring method that involves the passive adsorption of biotoxins onto porous synthetic resin bead filled bags. And then these bags are taken into the lab and processed to determine if the presence of the toxin has stuck to the surface of the resin bead. The great thing about SPAT is that it can be used with a wide variety of um, toxins, and it can also be used in a lot of different water types, including freshwater and saltwater applications. To measure the toxins in the lab, either from the SPAT bags or from filter samples, um, we can use an instrument called the liquid chromatography mass spectrometer. And what that's used for is to extract the toxins and look to see which toxins are present in the environment. Additionally, molecular techniques are used for a number of toxins present in the environment to determine presence or absence. And these can be purchased from commercial analytical chemistry companies. Another way to measure in situ are through these pretty elaborate, pretty well-defined um, ocean observing systems uh, developed by Dr. Chris Scholen and his team at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, or MBARI. And they call this suite the Environmental Sample Processor, or ESP. And what it does is it employs a suite of instruments to sample for algae, harmful algae, and a number of other microscopic organisms. Within the ESP, there are multiple that have been deployed throughout the world. They can be designed for a particular environment, and they can be deployed for up to a period of time. And what's great about the ESP is that it samples there in the field, and then it relays the information from the sampling to the, the scientist who's back on land. These in situ methods and observing systems are helping us to understand harmful algal blooms. They are essential to validating remote sensing methods. They are limited to a particular locations and for specific sampling times, depending on the methods that are being used. HAG detection using remote sensing has the advantage of providing information over a wide area, so not just that single location of an in situ measuring, um, measuring suite, and at a temporal frequency that may be greater than what is possible with in situ measurements. We still are dependent on those in situ measurements to validate, but remote sensing can take us much further afield. So some main takeaways, if you haven't already picked up on some of these, it's important to note that remote sensing imagery is a tool to aid in monitoring and forecasting of HAB events, to understand impacts to the ecosystem and or human health. Remote sensing imagery does not replace sampling on the ground. Imagery with associated algorithms and ecosystem models informs adaptive sampling approach, approaches used by resource managers. Some of the remote sensing data products used in HAB detection include understanding the chlorophyll concentration, because chlorophyll is a proxy for the phytoplankton, a chlorophyll and A anomaly, or how it's changed, algae discrimination based on the inherent optical properties, and coupled remote sensing observation and environmental condition modeling. 
While research is ongoing to detect toxins using remote sensing methods, it is currently not possible to detect toxins directly operationally using remote sensing imagery. Before going too far, I'll review some of the material I covered in the prerequisite webinar, Fundamentals of Aquatic Remote Sensing. I'm going to go a little bit more quickly through this because you've already had this material. If you've not already watched the fundamentals, I encourage you to do so before next week. So on this slide here, you have light from the sun passes through the atmosphere, and if it reaches the sea surface, it reflects off the surface or passes through it. The fate of the photon is to either be scattered or absorbed. As you can see here, absorbed by phytoplankton, non-algal particles, colored dissolved organic matter, or water itself will absorb the light. If scattered, it will do so in either the forward or backward direction. If in the backward direction, some of it will be re-emitted from the sea surface and will be detected by a sensor. In aquatic remote sensing, we are interested in the radiometric unit remote sensing reflectance, or RRS, and that you see in the upper part of the slide here. Remote sensing reflectance is used in the ocean color algorithms to compute data products of interest for ocean aquatic science and aquatic science like chlorophyll concentration. RRS can be defined as the ratio of backscattering to the total absorption and backscattering as affected by the local sun and sky conditions. So it has a lot to do with what the material is in the water um, that you see in the cartoon on the left. Alternatively, it can be defined as the water leaving radiance or light just above the surface to the incoming or downwelling irradiance incident on the sea surface. With this equation, we see the relationship of the inherent optical properties or absorption and scattering of the material in the water to the quantity and quality of light in the underwater light field. It is this RRS quantity that is derived from satellite remote sensing measurements. Because of these relationships of what is in the water to the color of light emitted from it, we can infer concentrations of optically active constituents in the upper part of the water column that the satellite can see. Here again is the equation for remote sensing reflectance. Light absorption and backscattering by the different constituents in the water column govern the color of light the sensor detects. The Landsat 8 OLI image to the right is of Rupert Bay in northern Canada. Doesn't it look like a latte? This image illustrates the effect of the different absorbent constituents in the water. This image here shows the dark water characteristic of colored dissolved organic matter, or CDOM. So you can see this square, it's the third down on the list, and it's in the upper left part of the image. This is coming from rivers flowing into the bay from the south as well as from the east. CDOM rich water tends to look black as it absorbs light strongly but does not reflect much light backwards. In the middle part of Rupert Bay, tidal forces cause resuspension of sediments, making for the light brown or latte color. Offshore of the mouth of the bay, there are regions of bluer water and regions that are slightly green, possibly due to phytoplankton. If you look at this and you're having a hard time seeing much of the differences I'm describing for chlorophyll water, CDOM, you're not alone. Part of the reason why I use this example is to emphasize to you that water is a dark target. Remote sensing reflectance in the visible range is low for water as compared to land. And so we must be very careful that the instruments that we use for the remote sensing imagers are sensitive enough for water targets. They're calibrated in the visible range and that we are careful not to overcorrect for the atmospheric effects on light absorption and scattering. So what would the reflectance spectra, or remote sensing reflectance spectra, look like for these different water types? In the figure on the right, you see wavelength across the x-axis and remote sensing reflectance on the y. Note how the remote sensing reflectance spectrum is very low for CDOM, but has a higher magnitude for sediments. This intuitively makes sense because the sediment image looks light brown and brighter to our eye. The water appears blue. Chlorophyll reflects strongly in the green. So to our eye, chlorophyll looks green. Look at the figure to the right. The gray vertical bars represent the wavelength ranges where a typical human eye detects light. Humans have color detecting receptors that sense light in about three ranges corresponding to blue, green, and red. Our eyes typically can only sense three wavelengths, 
whereas satellite sensors could detect even more depending on the spectral resolution of the sensor. Satellite sensors have been designed to collect light at wavelengths that are best for deriving ocean color data products like chlorophyll. Why chlorophyll? Because it's a compound common to most photosynthetic organisms, which form the base of the food web. Chlorophyll concentration is a proxy for phytoplankton biomass and can be used to infer primary productivity, or the uptake of carbon, and the ocean carbon cycle. It is also a measure that can be used to identify algal blooms, some of which may be harmful. One of the most common questions I'm asked about aquatic remote sensing is, how is it possible to obtain chlorophyll A concentration from remote sensing imagery? In the next few slides, I hope to convey to you a high-level understanding of how we derive this biophysical data product from imagery. Here is a schematic representation of the type of spectra on the left side one would obtain from waters with different chlorophyll concentrations. The four example spectra correspond to the images on the right. Spectrum 1 is from water with the highest chlorophyll concentration, and each subsequent image has a decreasing chlorophyll concentration. This difference is also noted in the magnitudes of the spectra in the figure. As chlorophyll concentration decreases, the peak height at around 550 nanometers also decreases. One of the commonly used chlorophyll A algorithms is the fourth order polynomial relationship between a ratio of remote sensing reflectance at two wavelengths, about 550 and maybe 490, and chlorophyll A. This type of algorithm was derived from empirical data or data collected at sea. There are more than one chlorophyll algorithm that can be used for depending, there's more than one chlorophyll A algorithm that can be used, and it depends on the environment being studied. For example, if you're in the open ocean versus a coastal ocean, and also which satellite sensor is being used. Simply stated, the ratio of the two remote sensing reflectance measures are used as inputs into the algorithm, and the result is an estimate for chlorophyll. Validation of the chlorophyll algorithm is performed by collecting sea truth measurements of chlorophyll within about an hour of the satellite overpass. These in situ sea truth chlorophyll A measurements are then compared to the chlorophyll derived from the satellite measurements, and then the uncertainty is estimated. It is a surprisingly straightforward approach developed in the 1970s and 80s that continues to be refined and used today to estimate chlorophyll A from space. So now you've learned how chlorophyll A is derived from first principles of aquatic optics and how it is possible to make quantitative estimates of global chlorophyll from space, as you see in this image here. This is an animation of SeaWiff's imagery from 1997 to 2005. I'd like for you to look up in the North Atlantic, in this region between North America and Europe, and watch how over time it becomes green, and then it cycles to more blue, and then it comes back to more green. What you're witnessing here is evidence of the North Atlantic spring bloom. During spring, phytoplankton respond to increasing light, temperature, mixed layer depth, and the abundance of nutrients available to them. And the North Atlantic, as you see here, noticeably greens up with an algal bloom during this period. Chlorophyll A anomaly is the difference between a chlorophyll concentration on a particular day and a mean chlorophyll concentration over a particular length of time. The NOAA HAB Bulletin for the west coast of Florida in the U.S. is an example of a warning system that uses the chlorophyll A anomaly to indicate bloom conditions. In this case, the anomaly shows where the daily chlorophyll concentration differs from a mean computed over a 60-day period ending two weeks prior to the sample date. Anomaly methods are not exclusive to this particular organism that we talked about earlier in this session. They can be used to identify and track blooms of different algal groups in different regions of the world. So they're an effective way to identify regions of rapid change in chlorophyll concentration. The HAD bulletin model further confirms if the bloom is Karenia brevis by taking advantage of some of the optical properties or IOPs unique to the species in this environment. We will talk more about this bulletin in week three.
it is important to know that there are limits to the use of remote sensing for HAB detection. Remote sensing is an indirect measure. It's not actually measuring the toxins. We are not able to infer to phytoplankton species level. Imagery may not have the spatial, spectral, or temporal resolution needed for a particular type of HAB event. Plus, there are all of the limitations already associated with aquatic remote sensing, including sensor um, stability, atmospheric correction, sun glint, sun angle, and clouds. There are advantages, however, to using remote sensing for HABs. Remote sensing observations can inform water resource managers where to apply their sampling effort to verify the presence of a HAB. This process is also known as adaptive sampling. Remote sensing permits sampling at larger spatial scales and more frequent temporal scales than with in situ observations alone. Also, remote sensing observations can be used as a data layer to integrate into regional models or forecasting systems. So to summarize, we have provided an overview of marine and freshwater harmful algal blooms, discussed HABs, ecosystems, and human health, given some examples of in situ monitoring methods for HABs, provided a background for how remote sensing can be used for HAB detection, and canvassed advantages and limitations of remote sensing of HABs in aquatic environments. We thank you for your participation in today's session of this webinar series. A reminder that this series will meet each week on Tuesdays for three more weeks. Next week, Dr. Mehta will be discussing platforms and sensors, data access, and data processing. Please remember that we will have a short question and answer session immediately following this presentation. Type your questions into the chat feature of the webinar software. Thank you. Alrighty, so we're going to start up with the questions in just a moment. Uh, thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate it. If you look in our chat window in the bottom right, you see that Brock Blevins, uh, one of the webinar managers, has asked you to type your questions into the question box. So please send your questions there, and if you look at your screen, you should see that um, Brock, what is sharing here with the Google Doc, um, we're trying to, a new thing this time, and that is to um, have you guys submit your questions in the chat, and then we'll answer the questions, or I'll try to answer your questions. If I can't answer them this week, I'll go back and I'll research them, and I'll um, make sure to put them into this document. If during the week you'd like to send me an email and ask me questions, please do so at the email address that you see listed here. Um, I'll try to respond to them, and I'll also add them to this Google Doc as well. Okay, so let's get going on these. Um, one of the questions that came in uh, earlier, and I was able to have a little bit of time to answer the question. Uh, the other ones I wasn't able to, to get to, so I'm just going to answer them on the fly, those that I can do. Um, one of the questions was, is sample collection necessary for algal bloom identification or are remote sensing images enough for analysis? And my answer for this is that, as you guys know from this webinar and also maybe from your background for remote sensing, is you can identify an algal bloom using remote sensing imagery. Determining the taxonomic composition from that imagery is a lot more complicated, and there's a lot of active research. In fact, my area of research is on this topic. Um, in the webinar, uh, you can get the chlorophyll concentration. You can also get this concept of a chlorophyll anomaly. Um, and there are some algorithms that are used to identify to taxonomic group. Um, some of those include just looking at the pigments just to try to identify if there are cyanobacteria in the water. 
Um, and some of them actually use the inherent optical properties of the organism. So for example, Karenia brevis lives on the, um, in, well, lives in several places, a lot of places, but it's a known harmful algal bloom species in the Florida red tide, and it was mentioned in the slides. And it's kind of a chubby phytoplankton is how I think of it. I know that's not really a scientific term for it, but it's kind of big and it has low backscattering. And so um, that inherent optical property. And so because of that distinctive optical characteristic of this particular organism in this particular environment with the background phytoplankton populations having different types of um, optics, um, there have been methods developed to be able to characterize or to identify and discriminate this particular group from the background. And so when we get to week three, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. Um, when we talk about the NOAA had bulletin for the Gulf of Mexico, they can take advantage of that to get a better idea if that's what's there. Another example is with microcystis, and just a moment, this bugs me, I have to do this. Um, and it's the cyanohab organism that we mentioned, and it contains these little gas vesicles that cause it to rise to the surface. And it gives us this great, really distinctive surface scum. There are other scum forming cyanobacteria, so this is in no way a definitive way to identify if it's microcystis. But if you do have microcystis in an environment and you are identifying these scums, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the algorithms that we can use to identify these surface scums, then that can be one way that it can help you in your adaptive sampling, or in other words, how you send people out in the field to sample for that particular organism. So I think that that gets at question one. Um, the next, second question, I'm not an expert on wastewater treatment, so what I'd like for Elizabeth, the other person who's helping out here, is if she could please, yeah, exactly, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and then I started sending a note to Amy, the person who had requested question three, and I wasn't sure which slide was in reference for these same techniques. So um, Amy, I'm not going to say your last name, but if you could please send us a quick chat to clarify or send an email to my email address, please, and um, I'll try to address that question. Question number four talks about what is glint correction? Okay. so. When you took the fundamentals of aquatic remote sensing, I talked a fair amount about atmospheric correction. There are other pre-processing steps that you need to take with um, the correction of imagery of water surfaces. And one of those is the glint correction. So um, what happens is, depending on what the sun angle is, when the imager goes over the water surface and it collects the data, sometimes the reflectance, the specular reflectance, kind of think of a mirror, the reflectance of light up off of the surface just shines right back up and um, you get uh, an erroneous measure of what, you, you're not getting the information that you want of the water, the, the light that's leaving the surface of the water, the water leaving radiance. And so what you need to do is you need to find techniques that you can get rid of the glint or what that reflection um, is. And so one of the ways that people will do this is they'll subtract a value in the spectrum from the total value, um, but that only works to some extent. And this gets back to the issues that we have with aquatic remote sensing, unrelated, not just related to HABs, but to all aquatic remote sensing, is that sometimes the imagery that's collected is just not at the appropriate time of day or the seasonal um, cycle in terms of what the angle of the sun is over the water. And so <clears throat> image, satellite imagers are scheduled to try to collect um, those surface reflectances um, at the best time of day possible to avoid things like sun glint. So, um, but it still is an unavoidable part of the process. And if you ever go and look at, um, and Elizabeth, if you could make a note for me to put this in there, um, the scheduling of some of these satellite sensors, um, you'll see that they'll flag the data that this day is going to have too much glint because we just know in advance that it's just going to have too much glint. And they do this for MODIS when you collect the data. Okay. Okay, so um, dropping to six, I think it would be better for me to find the link and put the link in there. Um, my go-to place for looking at the algorithms um, for just a, a reference and then I can go back and read the papers um, is the NASA, NASA Ocean Biology Processing Group website. So that's where I'm going to look for this equation. I don't know it off the top of my head because it varies by sensor and also which algorithm is being used. And so 
it would be better for me to just go back and grab that for you and to, to put it into these notes. Um, so I apologize that I'm not going to have that answer for you right off the top of my head, but um, I need to go back and just um, grab that link and give it to you there. Okay, so number seven, which types of HABs are currently monitored with remote sensing? So there's um, something I didn't really talk about in the, the presentation itself is that we have area, active areas of research for HAB identification, and then we also have these operational tools, and I'm referring to the U.S. approach to looking at HABs. And um, so there's a lot of work that's being done on trying to identify and monitor for the HABs. And I can share with you some of the knowledge that I have on the research side of it, but we're going to be talking about some of these operational approaches as well. So some of the work that's being done on HAB detection um, that's on the research side and also that's um, starting to make its way into the operational um, is the CI and the color index or cyanobacterial index. Um, the, this approach is going to be referenced in week four pretty extensively. We'll be talking about the algorithm that's used for that. And that's to help us identify those surface scums of microcystis um, and other um, mat forming cyanobacterial blooms. And so um, that's an example of some research. There's other research that's being actively done on trying to identify certain pigments that are related to cyanobacteria. Um, so, uh, cyanobacteria contain uh, phycocyanin. It's an accessory pigment that's used for photosynthesis. And um, this phycocyanin has a signature, distinctive characteristics in its spectrum. And so trying to take advantage of that phycocyanin presence to be able to identify, is there cyanobacteria in the water? Because you can have a region where you've got this huge chlorophyll bloom, but you don't know, okay, is it likely to be a harmful cyanobacterial bloom, or is it just a big a big diacom bloom or something like that. And so what this phycocyanin algorithm can do is it can help you address that question is, okay, is this in the water? And oftentimes these algorithms can be used together. Another research one is one that I developed with um, some folks um, in California to try to identify microcystis. And this one requires much higher spectral resolution data than can be used um, with existing satellite sensors. And it takes advantage of looking again at those peaks and troughs in the spectral, um, in the uh, remote sensing reflectance spectrum to try to identify the um, presence of, discriminate among different cyanobacterial groups and then determine, okay, if we know the succession patterns of one cyanobacterial bacterial group and it always precedes this to really toxic one, that, that the less toxic precedes the more toxic, then can we use that to um, image an area over and over again and say, hey, this cyanobacteria is in the water and the likelihood is high that the, this toxic one is going to be in the water next. So those are just some examples of ones that I'm familiar with. Like I said, in week three and in week four, we're going to be talking about the NOAA HAB Bulletin. We're also going to be talking about, um, we have a guest speaker, Dr. Clarissa Anderson, is going to be talking about her HAB um, algorithm and modeling system to forecast. And so we'll go into a lot more detail on the operational side of things uh, later in the series. Okay, I'm going to take a breath here and look at some of these other questions. Eight, kind of addressed in that earlier one. Okay. Uh, number nine, I think that it might be best if I provide some links to those uh, and references to papers. So, um, the, Elizabeth, if you don't mind just putting a note there to me as an action item. There are a couple of papers that are coming out of Florida that I think, especially with Karenia Brevis, um, started in 2000 five to 2007 and then have been updated since then and are being incorporated into that HAB bulletin. Okay, so number 10. So this could be a complicated question, but I'm going to just go for the direction that most of the HABs that I mentioned in this webinar series and that um, I'll be talking about and our guests will be talking about the, the ones that cause the shellfish poisoning. The ones that we are going to be referencing, it's through the, mostly the marine ones. When it's shellfish poisoning, typically those do not pose a risk in a drinking water um, situation, um, partly because they're marine, but also um, you cannot consume enough uh, of that toxin um, for it to be dangerous to you, typically speaking. This is, 
under usual HAB conditions. Um, it's these, uh, so even if you could drink salt water, you probably wouldn't ever get to the level of concentration of the toxin that it would be dangerous to you. These are filter feeders that are consuming large quantities of water and concentrating it. And then oftentimes, not in all cases, it's being um, bioaccumulated. And so um, the organism that eats it and you may eat that organism in some of the cases. Um, with the drinking water situation though, they, you can, uh, the toxins are at a level that you could drink even a small quantity of water and it could be dangerous for you. We have um, a lot of researchers in California where I live who are doing um, work on this problem and uh, the area up in Klamath River in Northern California um, has pretty high toxin levels of microcystin and also um, we have a lake that's actually fairly close to where I live called Lake Chabot where they had a situation where dogs were running into the water, you know, playing around and then coming out and then licking themselves clean and just the amount of water that they were licking um, to lick themselves clean, uh, that was enough to be toxic for them to, to die. And so um, it does not take very much. I am always very careful when I go to sample in um, our local toxic lake, um, Pinto Lake, um, I wear gloves and I'm really careful because I just, I just don't want to risk it. And um, I think the safe limit is one part per million, I think it is, for microcystis. I need to double check this. And at Pinto Lake, it's regularly at 1,000. So I'm really cautious in that environment. OK. OK. Um, Number 13 here, I'd like to know how I can apply monitoring in places that are located in high elevation, more or less uh, 2650 meters uh, in Bogota, because um, I'd like to do it with a wetland there. And what do I recommend? OK. Again, this is going to be one where I'm going to be providing a link. The question gets to a remote sensing question and also the in situ monitoring question. And that is, in any question that you're going to be asking with remote sensing, and this comes up and again and again, and we really want to be able to use remote sensing for a lot of places, especially these really hard to get to places, but it's the size of the surface. So the size of the lakes or wetlands that you may be referring to, and also the amount of open water in those wetlands that you can see um, using an imager. If you're using Landsat, which has 30 meter per pixel um, spatial resolution, and you are still able to pick up chlorophyll in these shallow bottoms, which may be an issue with a Landsat chlorophyll algorithm, it might be possible to use that tool. Again, I don't know what the cloud cover is in these environments, but there may be then also the added risk that you would have cloud cover regularly. Um, so a question is the spatial resolution that you need, the temporal resolution. So Landsat's only every 16 days. That's Landsat 8 that I'm referring to. And so would it be at a spatial and temporal resolution that, that you could use? So if you, however, you're using airborne imagery that you can control, or um, UAVs or drones that you can control when they go up, then that gives you the opportunity to be able to have control over when those images are collected. And so it's still a lot of the same concepts of how you would do the image analysis. It's just that um, now it's on a different platform. And so um, in that case, you might uh, be interested in looking at if people have access to these wetlands, would there be the potential for doing a citizen science project um, for identifying algal blooms? There's an app that I'm going to refer to in week four called Hydrocolor, where you can actually measure the um, surface reflectance and use that as an input maybe into a citizen science project that you develop, that you have people go out and they can measure the reflectance and send it back to you. And over time, you could collect that data to see, hey, um, are we seeing an increase in chlorophyll concentration in this environment? Environment. Um, okay, continuing to scroll, how many have we got here? Okay. Uh, number 14, I'm going to have to get back to the questioner on this, and I apologize, but I'm just going to need to do a little bit more research on that. Uh, the fourth order polynomial question I already addressed, so 15, that I think is the same as one higher up. Um, just a moment. Continuing to scroll. 17, I don't know the answer to that one, but I can continue, I can do the research on that. Mm. 
okay. What percentage of the toxin may get passed higher in the food web? I'll need to talk to some, I'll need to get that. And I think it's going to be specific to a particular toxin. Um, some of these are water soluble toxins and some of them are fat soluble. So it kind of depends on which toxin you're referring to. Um, so uh, for example, uh, domoic acid is a water soluble one. It does stay in the environment for some period of time in some organisms and some of their tissues, but it, it does get, tend to get flushed out of the environment a little more quickly than some of the other toxins. And so for 18, Elizabeth, if you can make a note for me to, to get back on that one. Okay. Okay. So uh, for question 20, I'm going to skip 19 and answer that in the document. Um, the harmful algal bloom is kind of a subjective uh, call. Uh, it's, is it harm to humans in terms of their health or commerce or to the ecosystem? So there are different varieties of these harmful algal blooms, but is there one definition that's agreed upon? In my experience, there are several definitions that different groups agree on. So it kind of depends on which organization that you're, you're talking to, how you want to define what that distinction is between the harmful and non-harmful. Um, it could be as much as, oh, this, this uh, high biomass red tide is really ugly and it's affecting our, our commerce because the tourists don't want to come here, but it could be not an oxygen depleter and it could just be a, a high bloom and, and it still would be considered harmful if it's affecting the commerce. And so I could provide several definitions for that, but there's not just one agreed upon definition. Number 20, if chlorophyll value is high, it means the presence of blooms. And the, if we're talking about phytoplankton concentration increasing um, above some background level, then yes, it's a bloom and it's a perturbation in the system that causes this increase. And so the chlorophyll value would be high. However, if the question is, can you have a harmful algal bloom and still have relatively low chlorophyll concentrations, that's possible because some of these organisms produce pretty potent toxins and the environment could look like it's just a regular background concentration of chlorophyll in the water, but you could still be having a harmful bloom because those toxins are in the environment. So for example, I think um, here in Monterey Bay where I live, um, we'll get fairly high concentrations of saxitoxin in the environment. <clears throat> but it won't look any particularly different from one, um, one day to the next. And so um, this is where remote sensing may or may not really be your, um, helping you unless you're able to identify to taxonomic group. And even then, the, the phytoplankton biomass would be so low, it may not be a help to you. So again, this gets back to the, we are not, or the remote sensing community is not trying to use remote sensing to replace ground sampling. It's used to enhance, it's used as a tool for adaptive sampling to be able to go out and measure in the environment and know where to measure. Remote sensing covers such a broad area that just sampling over and over again from one location, you're not going to get all of the, the nearby locations. So remote sensing can help send other people out to sample in locations you may not regularly sample. Okay. Let's see what time it is. Okay. As far as I'm aware, there is not a specific algorithm for detecting pseudonychia blooms. There is an active area of research that I didn't really talk about that much in trying to do what's called phytoplankton functional type, PFT, discrimination where you can um, separate groups based on uh, particular characteristics. Some of these PFT algorithms separate them by size class because oceanographers are really interested in understanding how um, different phytoplankton size classes feed different ecosystems or take up different amounts of carbon. Um, another area of PFT algorithm research is on trying to separate into different taxonomic groups. And there's a very active um, group of people who work on these sorts of questions and they're using different approaches. 
the promise or the, the hope that people might have that you could get it down to genus um, at this point is an unrealistic one because um, the optical properties of, for example, Pseudonychia is a diatom. So the optical properties of Pseudonychia are not so greatly different than uh, the optical properties of something like Ketoceros. Even though they do look pretty different under the microscope, um, they look very similar um, optically because they contain very similar pigments and they um, also have the same sort of material for their cell wall. And so their absorption and their scattering characteristics are very similar, and so it would be really difficult to separate them at this time. So it would be awesome if we could do something like that, but at this time, it's just not possible to get down to something as low as genus. Um, there are some people who are doing work that they're able to separate um, major groups like, pro like the cyanobacteria from the diatoms from the haptophytes, um, even as close as uh, separating dinoflagellates from diatoms, which are very similar optically because their absorption characteristics. But the, the hope is not there yet where we could get to the genus level. Okay. Okay, number uh, 23. Um, there are methods to using unmanned aircraft. Um, the, one of the limitations with that is um, in terms of if you're using something off the shelf for your camera systems, does it have the spectral resolution that, you, um, that would be useful for this? So uh, like we think of cameras, a point and shoot camera, the camera that you've got on your phone or something, um, if you could uh, get more colors out of it or estimate more colors out of it, um, that can be useful for um, detection of algae. Um, these chlorophyll algorithms are used in these satellite imagers and we have more than just these three wavelengths for, or wave bands um, for doing the analysis. Um, we need wave bands that are specifically in the location that can help us identify the chlorophyll. So you could still get by with three, but you need them to be in the right um, spectral, um, at the right spec, uh, wavelength in the spectrum. Now, perhaps you could be creative and say, would it be possible to use something like the algorithm that's used in hydrocolor, which uses a, a smartphone camera, and then apply some of those concepts to collecting data with drones. I don't know if that's actually been done, and I've been really interested to see if anyone will develop that, um, because that may be one way you could bridge the, can I use drones in my environment, my very limited budget, and can I use other technology? Um, the error bars on the hydrocolor um, algorithms are pretty wide, but would that be good enough for your system if you're not necessarily making uh, regulation choices, but perhaps adaptive sampling choices on um, going and sampling the water after observing it with a drone? Okay, question 24. Uh, yes, the hyperspectral remote sensing imagery can give, um, provide, it provides more information to be able to separate these algal species. Can it provide better accuracy? Um, is it still being tested? So this is an area, if you, whoever asked this question, if they want to send me an email and ask me more questions, this is my area of research. And so I'd be happy to talk more with whoever um, submitted. I can't see the list of questioners uh, as I talk here. Okay. All righty. So uh, NASA's chlorophyll LA product is free. Could you provide specific um, examples of its applications in the U.S.? Uh, so the chlorophyll A product is free and you can obtain it um, from the level one and level two browser at NASA. Um, Amita is going to talk about this a lot more next week. Um, and then uh, specific examples of um, examples in the U.S., this product is used pretty widely. So um, many of the, um, if you, I mean, I'm talking just generally, not just harmful algal blooms. Uh, I use this chlorophyll algorithm pretty regularly for the research that I've done. Um, it depends on which algorithm you're using for a particular environment. So for example, people who are doing research off in the global ocean may be using a different algorithm than for, I use it for coastal systems, so I use a different algorithm. Um, and who issues what have warnings? That comes from a variety of different entities. Uh, in California, where I live, uh, the California Department of Fish and Game will um, provide these, uh, the water resources, uh, natural water 
water and natural resources boards will provide um, warnings. The EPA provides warnings. NOAA provides warnings. So there are a lot of different entities that provide these warnings. And so there's been a lot of work done to try to um, streamline it and also, at least where I live, and also to be sure that the models that they're using when they do these forecasts for harmful algal blooms have the um, skill to be able to predict it um, with some confidence and then trying to work with uh, resource managers on making the call on uh, should we put out the warning or shouldn't we? Is it um, do we trust that this algorithm is or uh, that our model is um, is what its accuracy is? And so Dr. Clarissa Anderson will be talking a fair amount more about the model that she's developed and some of the questions that they have to address related to that topic. Okay. Okay, so minimum size water body, I think I kind of addressed that it depends on the sensor that you're looking at. Um, so it'd be important to look at, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about the different sensors and some of their specifications um, next week. And if, if this level of detail of the spatial resolution is not there for all of the sensors, you'll have the sensor name and, and you can um, search that information. But it depends a lot on what the spatial resolution is of that sensor. So let's say, for example, you're working with MODIS, which has a one kilometer, um, sensor, you would need your body of water to be approximate, at a minimum nine kilometers across um, in order to trust that. And that's a back of the envelope. You can actually do a, a, an analysis of how, what's your minimum water body size for this. And so for MODIS, open ocean, that's fine. But in situations where you have an inland body of water, um, Landsat 8 may be a more appropriate um, sensor with the 30 meter um, spatial resolution. So just those comparing those two. But um, what's exciting is the European Space Agency is putting up these sensors that have um, even uh, finer spatial resolution. And so um, the series of imagers that, um, that's coming out from there in the Sentinel series, um, you can start getting at these inland bodies of water. Um, and Amita will be talking a little bit more about those sensors next week. Okay. All righty. I'm going to um, need to address a lot of the questions that are coming in, I think, uh, through the, um, the document, um, just because we're, getting, we're running out of time here. And um, I do want to point anyone towards uh, who have image processing questions. There's one here, question 32, using CDAS. CDAS has gone through an, a huge improvement um, and changes in the last um, five years. Uh, I think it was 2013 they released a completely new CDAS and the UI um, is a lot more intuitive to use and it's a lot less complicated. Um, it replicates a lot of the other image processing software that's out there. And so I'd encourage um, the questioner to look at the Ocean Biology Processing Group website um, that NASA has and to follow the links to CDAS. Uh, Amita will be talking about this next week as well. Uh, we do not provide an overview of how to actually use CDAS, although that may be some future um, RSET webinar, uh, who knows. But, um, but CDAS, if you're going to be working with NASA data, is a really intuitive way to, to process the, the imagery, and it's free. And um, it, I, I encourage people to look at the CDAS website and to look at some of the tutorials that they have available. Okay. Wow. Okay, so I'm gonna need to, to wrap it up here. I know I have a lot of questions here that are um, still left hanging. Um, Brock and Elizabeth will be making this document available and I will address these. It'll probably take about two days or so for me to, to fill in all of these questions, but I encourage you to, to touch back to this document uh, when they make it available. Alrighty, so. I just want to remind you guys that next week we will be talking about platforms and sensors, data access, and data processing. And uh, Dr. Amita Mehta will be our speaker on that day. And I hope that you've gotten something out of today's talk. I know that some of you are coming from a HAB background. Some of you are coming from the remote sensing background. And we hope that combined over the next four weeks that we give you the information that you need to be able to move on, think about how we can use remote sensing to detect HABs in the environment. 
And with that, I'll sign off for today, and thank you.